I'm Roger Woods, minister with the Wald Lake Church of Christ near Detroit, Michigan. I want to thank you for joining me today for this pre-recorded sermon and Lord's Supper devotional for Sunday, October 25th, 2020. If you live in the area or are visiting, please come by and visit our church. We have rebooted our in-person Bible classes for all ages on Sundays. Bible school is at 1010 a.m. and worship starts at 11. We are blessed to have a spacious facility where we can spread out and safely meet together. We do ask that you wear a mask and practice all the precautions related to the spread of COVID-19. We want everyone to be safe. As we begin our time together today, let's start by singing a song that reminds us of the beauty and the importance of the church. The Church's One Foundation. Number 715 in Songs of Faith and Praise, the hymn book that we have in our pews here at the Wald Lake Church. Let's sing together. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. He lacked from every nation, yet one o'er all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she presses, with every grace endued. Mid toil and tribulation, and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with the vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed. And the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Our scripture reading today comes from Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 20, through the fourth chapter, verse 6. Hear the word of the Lord. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So then, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians, we, we, we find Paul unpacking God's eternal purposes throughout all of history. It's like he's pulled back the curtain and, and let us see what God is doing. These first three chapters are some of the richest teachings in the Bible for understanding what God is up to and how his purposes are being carried out and what that means for us. Then comes chapter 4. In this chapter, Paul is drawing conclusions from everything that he has said up to that point. Paul has been telling the Ephesians what God is up to, and then he turns his attention from God and his eternal purposes to the difference it should make in their lives, and of course in our lives today. In light of what God is up to, he says, this is how you should live. 
And then he goes even further. As a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Paul's going further and saying that all that he's taught in chapters 1 through 3 amounts to a calling that every believer in Jesus Christ has received. Now, what does that mean? You know, often we read scripture in an individualistic way. Um, or we read it in a third-person way. Uh, not always do we read it in that holistic sense that Scripture is written in the first place. Um, when we keep it in the first tense, we over-personalize what we're supposed to be doing in Christ. When we keep it in the third person, we push it away from ourselves as if that means we don't have to do it. Now, there's a place for we language, and there's a place for I language. And Paul is trying to help them understand that our walk with Christ is more than a first person experience. Yes, we are each individually saved, but we are also saved together as a church, and it is together that we need to be working to glorify God. Today, I'd, I'd like to invite you to modify this passage of Scripture in order to take its message to heart, to understand that we are them. It can serve as a pledge of sorts, if you will, to follow God's will and not just a theory about God's will. We're all good at that. We're all good at theory. But to take it down into practice, into a practical way of life. So as I say this prayer, uh, notice that I change everything to I. Let's say this again. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I will live a life worthy of the calling I have received. I will be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with my brothers and sisters in love. I will make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I believe there is one body and one Spirit, just as I was called to one hope when I was called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, that's a subtle change to the wording, isn't it? Yet it brings home the reality of what Paul is trying to say, namely that our life in Christ, in his church, is not a hobby that we dabble at. It is a calling in which we are caught up and carried away. Yes, I know it's a bit scary to be carried away, to give up control, but only if we are deluded into thinking that we have ever had control in the first place. Your Jesus taught that we are all mastered by something. The choice we face is who do we wish to be our master? I love the illustration that says, uh, you know, if Jesus is your co-pilot, change seats. <laughs> he needs to be the pilot. He needs to be in control. Paul, well, he's made a choice, hasn't he? He has chosen to be the Lord's prisoner. In that relationship, he understands that his will is now the will of his master. But this is no ordinary master slave relationship. <laughs> no, this master has lavished his love upon us by adopting us into his family. From excluded from the covenant to included, from slaves to co-heirs with his son and members of the body of Christ, his church. We were bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ for a purpose, to show in our lives, singularly and together, the power of Christ to the glory of God. Any way you slice it, being a Christian is all about you and me moving from me to we, moving from my will to his will, from receiving God's grace to becoming a conduit of that grace to others. When we were called by God, we were not called to a solitary life of service to God. It is in the church, the body of Christ, that we were placed to serve together to the glory of God. In Acts 2, 47, we learn that the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. 
A few verses earlier, we read that the believers shared their life together, studying the apostles' teaching, worshiping in the temple, breaking bread in each other's homes. Later, we read of the way that they took their individual abundance and shared it with the church so that no one in the church lacked for anything. They understood that it was together in Christ that they were saved. Yes, they were persecuted, but they were also respected. And as a result, more and more came to Christ, even though it might mean persecution for them. They still came to Christ. They did not accept Jesus as their personal Savior, as if they were the center of the universe. They accepted him as their Lord and Savior, their Master. They understood their relationship, and they led, and it led that understanding led them to live their lives up to the calling in which they had been called in Christ Jesus. They understood that accepting his call meant following Christ's example. To follow Christ, as Paul would later put in Philippians 3.10, meant, yes, sharing in his resurrection, the glory stuff. But it also meant participating in his suffering and becoming like him in his death. Craig Larson defines our calling as he describes what it means to be a member of God's church. Being a member of a church member is a vocation, a way of life. It means participation in an intricate web of hospitality, living at the intersection of human need and God's grace, and having a community where men and women who don't fit in are welcomed, where neglected children are noticed, where the stories of Jesus are told, and people who have no stories find that they do have stories, stories that are part of Jesus' story. Being a church member places us strategically yet unobtrusively at the heavily trafficked intersection between heaven and earth. Frederick Buchner defines our calling as this. The place God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Oh, how deep that hunger is. You know, we sing the song, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, O Lord. But at least we know God. That is our gladness. Imagine knowing something is wrong, but not being able to identify it or begin to know what the remedy for it could be. But all at the same time, knowing something just isn't right. You know, if it were not for those who introduced us to Christ, we would not know the living water that is now our life. God called us to model kingdom life so that those wandering in the world trying to figure out what's wrong would know their need and where to find a remedy for it. So we must live a life worthy of our calling because it is how the world will know their Savior. I'm ending my first segment of the Strive to Thrive series that I will be doing on and off here for several months. Uh, And this has been based on really the first three chapters, but focusing primarily on chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. But today I want to dip beyond chapter 3 and take a look at chapter 4, particularly verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 focuses on our relationship with Christ and the nature of our calling. Verse 2 of chapter 4 focuses on what living a life worthy of the call would look like. It would look like someone who is being completely humble, gentle, someone who is patient, someone who bears with others in love. Jesus told his apostles that the world will know that they are his disciples by the love that they have for one another. What does love in a Christ-like relationship look like? Well, he makes that clear, doesn't he? Paul does in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, passage we all know. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. Love is not proud. It is not rude. Love does not seek its own things. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. 
Paul knew that when the church followed the way of love in Christ, the Lord's way, the way to which they were called, then nothing could stop God's people. But if they ate and devoured one another, well, then they would be utterly destroyed. Oh, that our world, that we ourselves, quite frankly, could know and understand this truth. Church, this election cycle is an opportunity to shine. Let's not put bushels over our candle by becoming worldly in our tactics, using those worldly, militant tactics in the battles that our land is facing today. Yes, let's stand with conviction and in the power of the Lord, but let's shun the tactics of this world, such as slander, such as false accusations, such as mean-spirited jibes. And instead, let us speak the truth in love. We can do this. We have the Spirit of God living within us. Let's live up to our calling. This starts, church, in the place where we are right now, in the church. In the church, we learn to love and forgive. In the church, we learn to put others first and ourselves last. It is the place that we learn to be like Jesus. Then we're called to do something completely unexpected and not always appreciated. We are called to treat those outside of Christ the same way by loving and praying for them, even for our enemies. And when we do this, some will notice. In 2011, New York Times colonist Nicholas Kristof wrote a column praising the work of many conservative Christians. Kristof begins by noting that at times Christian leaders do act hypocritically and don't reflect Christ. However, he also goes on to write the following. But in reporting on poverty, disease, and oppression, I've seen so many others, conservative Christians, who are disproportionately likely to donate 10% of their income to charities, mostly church-related. More important, to go to the front lines, at home and abroad, in the battles against hunger, malaria, prison, rape, abortion, human trafficking or genocide. And some of the bravest people you meet are conservative Christians or conservative Catholics, similar in many ways, who truly live their faith. He concludes with these remarks. I'm not particularly religious myself, but I stand in awe of those I've seen risking their lives in this way, and it sickens me to see that faith mocked at New York cocktail parties. Well, that sickens us too, doesn't it? But there's something we need to hear here. People notice. Yes, there are times when I just wish God would bring 10,000 angels and whoop up on this world a little bit. Maybe a little fire and brimstone would help. You know, James and John might have been right when they said, let's call fire down on this village. No. <laughs> Just as Jesus rebuked them in Luke 9, 53. So he rebukes us when we think we have to fight for his honor. God's honor is above reproach. His kingdom is eternal. And as Jesus reminded us, it is not of this world. We defend God's honor when we live for him humbly, and gently, when we are forgiving and forbearing towards one another and towards those in the world. And when we live up to our calling, God can, will, and is doing incredibly more than we can ask or imagine. In the early days of the church, before it came into favor with the Roman Empire, <clears throat> Christians reached out to the sick and to the poor, and they were mocked for it. But Christians were also the ones who stayed in town and took care of the sick when plagues broke out. They were the ones who rescued babies that had been abandoned on the hillsides to die of exposure because they were ill, they were deformed, they were just a girl and unwanted. As the great mission hymn declares, where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. Brothers and sisters, we are called to extend his grace through our lives, live sacrificially, 
at the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. And that place is at the foot of the cross of Jesus. It is in front of an empty tomb. It is from that place that we find the strength to live as more than conquerors, to live a life worthy of the calling, not because of our ability to do that, but because of God's spirit, his power working within us. It is at that place that we become truly one as a church and truly one with our Lord. Christians, are you struggling to live up to your calling? We all feel that, don't we? I know I do. Remember this. You have the Spirit of God living in you. You have the promises of God to help you when you fall. Yours are all the precious promises of God answered yes in Christ Jesus. Don't let Satan put you on the sidelines because of your sin. Instead, trust in Christ's power to forgive and empower you to be more than conquerors in him. Let your faith in Christ be the anchor for your soul. Let your, no, let his hand guide your ship and let God's spirit fill your sails and power your journey through life and into life eternal. If you are searching for something but have not found it, I want to let you know that it can be found in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, we're told in the letter to the Hebrews that God's Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being who sustains all things through his power. And after he provided purifications for sin through his atoning death on the cross, he was raised to eternal life and sits at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Hebrews 1, 3. Now you can search the world over and you will not find that which satisfies your need. But in Christ, you will find the living water, the eternal manna from heaven that will nourish your soul and save your eternal life in him. I want to encourage you to come to him. If you are not yet a Christian, don't let a day go by without doing this. Come to him in simple faith, simple, obedient faith. Let God's grace enter into your life today by turning away from the world and to his Son, Jesus Christ. Confess Jesus as God's Son and your Lord, and then obey his commands. If you believe that Jesus is God's Son, that he died for your sins, that he was raised again to eternal glory, then you've already taken the first steps. Now step fully into your salvation by obeying his command to be baptized, to die to yourself, and to live for him. It's nothing that you're doing to earn your salvation. You're simply obeying what God has told you to do. And in those waters of baptism, your faith and God's grace meet at the foot of the cross. You die to your old life of sin and are raised to a new life in Christ Jesus. Your sins are washed away and you are freed to live under the new master. One that chose you and that you accepted the call to follow. And when you accepted that call to follow, you got more than you thought you'd get because he has taken you into his household and made you a precious son and daughter of his. I want to encourage you to join with us, the church, as we glorify God through our service in Jesus' name from generation to generation until he comes again. Of course, all of this is made possible because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We're going to sing a song now as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper. And this song is a song that describes the body of Christ. Uh, The song is called How Beautiful. It's found in uh, our Songs of Faith and Praise hymn book uh, at hymn number 600 and 365. Um, and in this, it, uh, it does a little turn here. Uh, verse 1 is talking about Jesus. Uh, verse 2 is talking about the church. And then verse 3, it talks about the church again, but it uses the same words 
as the first verse used to talk about Jesus. Church, we are the body of Christ. And as we partake of this Lord's Supper, we cannot just focus on ourselves. Remember, this is not just me, it's also we. We are the body of Christ, and we serve this world in Jesus' name. When we partake of the bread, we are reminded that Jesus died for all the world because God loved the world so, so that their sins could be paid for, forgiven, a worthy sacrifice given, one that we could not give. When we partake of the cup, we partake of that new covenant in his blood. And in that new covenant, we have agreed to be his ambassadors in this world, to be his hands, to be his feet, to be his words of comfort to a lost and dying world. Let's sing this song together. How beautiful the hands that served The wine and the bread and the sons of the earth How beautiful the feet that walked The long dusty road and the hill to the cross How beautiful, how beautiful how beautiful is the body of Christ. How beautiful the radiant bride who waits for her groom with his light in her eyes. How beautiful when humble hearts give the fruit of pure lives so that others may live. How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful is the body of Christ. And as he laid down his life, we offer this sacrifice that we might live just as he died, willing to pay the price, willing to pay the price. How beautiful the feet that bring the sound of good news and the love of the King. How beautiful the hands that serve the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful is the body of Christ. Let's pray together. Holy God, help us to, in our minds, go back to that table on the night that Jesus was betrayed as he sat with his apostles and broke bread at that last Passover meal. Father, help us to understand the foreboding sense of dread that he had and yet the great love that propelled him forward even knowing that he sat at that table with his betrayer lord god your love is so great your love is so powerful your love is so overwhelming and we are so grateful that your love is directed toward us we're so grateful that your love broke down so many barriers that kept us from being truly one with you. Thank you that in Christ, as he established this memorial, that he established it in a way that we could remember it throughout all ages. Common bread, common drink, that helped us to be able to understand that Every day can be a reminder of what he has done for us. But Lord, on these Lord's days, we come together as the church 
and we partake of this bread and we partake of this cup to remember that new covenant that was given to remember uh, what he has done for us so that we will be reminded that we have a mission we have a purpose in this life to each of us individually as members of the body of Christ to fulfill our calling to serve you by serving the sons of man so that they will know the love of Christ. Lord, as we partake of this bread representing his body, help us to focus on that sacrifice, that perfect life that was given in our place. Thank you for that love that sent him to the cross. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's partake of the bread. <clears throat> now let's pray for the cup. Holy God, we're thankful for this cup representing the blood of Christ, which was shed for us, shed for the forgiveness of sins for the whole world, for all who will come through faith to accept him as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, what an what a incredible gift we have in Christ, for when we accept the Son, we get the Father. We get the Spirit. We get so much, Lord. Help us to understand what we get by obeying and accepting this new covenant. And help us to live up to the calling that we have in Christ. Forgive us when we fail, Lord, and we do. Thank you for your grace that picks us up when we fall down, that lifts us up out of the miry clay, sets us on the rock, and establishes our way. Thank you for this reminder, Lord. And thank you for the forgiveness we have through his blood. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I just want to thank each one of you again for joining me today. I pray that your uh, Sunday goes well uh, and your next week goes well. Let's keep our nation in your prayers as we go through this political cycle. Let's keep the whole world in our prayers when we go through as we go through this COVID-19 cycle. But let's keep firmly in mind that our, our greatest problem is not politics. Our greatest problem is not a virus. Our greatest problem is sin and we have the antidote let's let that fully inhabit our lives and let's share it with others so that they too can be more than conquerors in this world through jesus christ our lord god bless you and have a good day